In December 1983, the Associated Press Newswire ran the story of a Vietnam veteran who had lived totally isolated in the wilds of Washington State for almost 10 years. He was shown half naked, hunting in the woods. He had not been alone. In the weeks that followed, dozens more Vietnam veterans were discovered hiding in the wilderness, living in self-imposed exile, hiding out in the country they felt had rejected them after the Vietnam War. They were angry, embittered, and dangerous. To make this film, we combed the country in search of soldiers still in hiding, to protect themselves from others, and to protect us all from themselves. Nobody's John Wayne over there, you know? The Audie Murphy's kind of died out a long time ago. We just tried to stay alive. I don't know, I sometimes wonder why. I think about those fuckers that died over there, and I think that uh, they had one up on us, you know? Well, they did. They, they, they came home in a body bag, but they came home as heroes. And uh, we come home as scum. My life was in Vietnam. I finally realized that when I got back from the Nam, everything that I had going for me, it just seemed like it was back in the Nam. The most important thing that I ever done in my life was Nam. Just about everybody got blown away. One black guy ended up with the Medal of Honor. Of course, he died for it. The radio guy got the Silver Star, came back in all covered in blood, and I was still in the hospital. And he, I went back to see him, and he said something about I was too gung-ho. I was high, I had a high fever. I don't really remember it all that clearly, but uh, I remember remembering that, that I was too gung-ho. When you're scared all the time, you're alert. There's certain things you know that you have to do, and if you don't do it, you're dead. So you do it the best way you know how. and pretty soon you get good at it. And a little bit after that, you even start to kind of enjoy it a little bit, maybe. And then you start getting short and you start getting scared all over again, you know? I don't think I did survive Vietnam. I, um... At some point in Vietnam, I became 10,000 years old, and I died, and whoever I was before left a long ways behind and was replaced by whatever there is left. There are soldiers missing throughout these hills, fugitives from their families and friends. After Vietnam, they ran away, and today, some 15 years later, they're still hiding from us all. One of the few men to make contact with veterans in the wild is Dr. John Wilson. Some men, and particularly the men who, who have to isolate themselves, uh, feel that they're still warriors. Vietnam was both exhilarating and horrifying, living on the edge, being intense in combat, facing death daily, and doing that with people that you care for a great deal. But in the midst of doing that, one encounters death and destruction and chaos and bodies blown apart and difficulty in understanding just why that's happening, why the war was being fought. And that struggle tends to live on in the minds of men today. Many of these men know that they don't fit into society and they fear losing control. They fear that they might harm someone. So the way they cope with that is to go into the woods and to live by themselves in a jungle-style existence because that way they can maintain control over an environment they came to know in Vietnam very well. They can become dangerous, potentially violent, or could even go into a flashback state where they would behave again like they did in combat in Vietnam. Many men feel trapped in the trauma. They feel like they're stuck in Vietnam, that they can't get out of it. So they may decide to kill themselves in the hopes that by doing so, they can return to Vietnam, to, to that old identity of the warrior, or to go back to the place of death where some of their most cherished buddies died in the war. I can never let go of the Vietnam experience because 
I have nothing else to go on. Vietnam is ever alive because I keep it alive. Vietnam, he's now a wanted man living outside the law. That's because Scott grows marijuana, smokes most of it, and sells the rest. He keeps one step ahead of the law using survival skills he learned in the Southeast Asian jungles. Vietnam gave me all the tools that I would ever need to work with for the rest of my life. After the war, Scott was classified 100% psychologically disabled. The Marines considered him permanently mentally scarred and no longer able to function responsibly in society. At 17, Scott joined the Marines to get away from his family and become his own man. He was chosen for special training in West Germany to hunt the Kong with attack dogs. In 1967, he was sent to Vietnam. In a way, he never came back. This reminds me a lot of Vietnam, and that's why I live here. It keeps me reassured that I am a survivor and I can survive in any jungle in the world. Hawaii is an atmosphere that heals, an atmosphere that allows me to repenetrate the jungle that was so familiar, so concealing, to hide when I needed to be alone, to get away from people. I find it very hard to be around people. While in Da Nang and Khe Sanh, Scott says he killed over 100 men in combat, and he wanted to go back for more. What I was seeking, I got more than my share of in the Marines. They not only guaranteed that they would make a man of me, they would take me beyond manhood. In a line of men, I was the first man out. My neck was always on the chopping block. There was always a bounty on me and the dog. I drank 100 proof old granddad bourbon. Half pint before we go out on an ambush, just to steady my nerves so that I wouldn't blow my fucking balls off with my own handgun. I was very good at what I did. For 11 months, Scott was a walking target in Vietnam, leading patrols with his dogs. The first to shoot and the first to be shot at. Back home, he missed the rush of combat, so he tried to re-enlist. One year after getting out, the war still going on, and they say they don't want me. We don't want your kind anymore. We don't need no high school dropouts. We don't need no brig rats. When I was a boy in high school, picking my nose and trying to hide my pimples, I was as tall as I am now, but I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag. All the little kids would beat me up. <laughs> Yeah, about that shit. I was a hardcore, mean man. I went out looking to do combat with the police. It set up situations in a bar, and then me and another guy, a partner of mine from now, we would take them on. I scared myself by how I behaved around my children. I wasn't what you'd call a fit father. After three years, Scott's first marriage was shattered. Today, he lives with a woman who understands his constant pain. If you're a sensitive person, you're going to be more aware of suffering around you. And for someone like Scott, I see someone that probably would have been an artist if he had not gone to the war, drawing madly away. But the war changed all that. He's caught up in every day, I'm a warrior, every day is a battle for me. It's very hard for me to say, relax, smile, <laughs> laugh with me, joke with me. It's hard to get that humor. Scylla is Scott's second wife. They've been married seven years, and she's still struggling to help him let go of Vietnam. The material that comes out is material that has been simmering and cooking inside, unsaid, unexpressed, for 15 years. It's the pot boiling over. When he 
paces at two in the morning, I can be there for him. I can listen to the rants. We'll get up, make a cup of tea, sit up, listen to some music, chat. I think a great amount of the Vietnam frustration and stress is not being able to communicate to someone at these bizarre hours that these guys are suffering. Uh, the nightmares come at night. Sometimes there's daymares too, I'm sure, but uh, at two and three and four in the morning when you need a, a buddy, a friend, a companion. I'm there and I am all these things with him. Not only am I his wife and his friend and his lover, but I'm his buddy and a companion and an outlaw in arms with Scott. Scott still needs to keep moving, so Silla's learned to pack their few belongings in less than an hour. They'll stay in Hawaii only long enough to harvest Scott's marijuana. What I look for when searching for a place to grow what is called locally Pakalolo, I look for deep depressions, canyons, crevices, and gullies that are choked with vegetation. Private individuals come out and look for marijuana patches all the time. And it's a common practice amongst most growers who are serious to employ booby traps of some kind to discourage those people who would come and rip us off. If I caught someone ripping off my marijuana, as I have caught people in the past, I have had weapons with me to uh, inflict bodily harm that would cause the individual to think of other things to do in another direction to go. Scott's weapon this time is a lethal trap he feared in Vietnam, the Malayan swing. We learned the use of booby traps from our enemies, the Viet Cong. In this case, I would build this to resemble a large fly swatter to abruptly slam into someone's face. But if I were to rig this up the way it is supposed to be rigged, the victim would be seriously hurt. This is an illustration that demonstrates the action of this particular trap. This part would be pulled back off the trail, set up so that the trip wire would be laid across the trail, waiting for the first person to come along. This is the victim, and the device has come around full circle and has struck him in the chest impaling him with three or four of the spikes. Once the lead mechanism was sprung and the first two or three people got hit with the, the Malayan swing, the rest of the people would seek cover on both sides of the trail, to which they would find when diving face first into the cover, these things right in the face, sharpened bamboo stakes with buffalo shit smeared all over it to decay and ferment. All it takes is one unfortunate encounter with a punji steak, much less the severity of a Malayan swing. And nobody, I mean nobody, would come this way again. There have been times when he has scared me. The thing that scares me most about him is his suicide wish. So that's my fear. I have told him this before. Look, if you're going to commit suicide, uh, which you tell me that this pressure has become so great with you, uh, just don't do it where I will find you. There's guys out in the backwoods of America. They will not show themselves because they are too bitter, too sad, and too committed to die in that state of mind. There was a combat ex-Marine like myself. He lives back in Washington. And I gave him one of my illustrations, and I guess he's got attacked to a tree or something. He lives up in the woods, disturbed, lonely. We found the man Scott told us about hiding in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. He's surviving in a tent, alone. His name is Bobby.
In his back pocket, he carried a gun. It's always with him, always loaded, and Bobby knows how to use it. I grew up in a Southern Baptist family, mama from Southern Georgia, and daddy from Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and I was born in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, on parachute silk. Birth announcement said first jump. I've been in the military since before I was conceived. Grew up on a homestead up in Alaska and uh, real fine physical condition and pretty good size for a boy. And uh, nobody ever challenged me. The only fights I ever got in with, with friends. Had these ideals, went out for sports, was good at it. It appealed to go in the military. I went in the military. I'm still in the military. Went in the Marine Corps from Vietnam, week out of high school. Graduated from boot camp on my 18th birthday. Top 10% of Marine Corps graduates. That was quite an honor to me. When I was 18 years old, boom. I didn't know anything. I thought I knew it all. But he knew he wanted to fight. So Bobby went to war. It was 1968. 34,000 lives were lost in the 10 days of the Tet Offensive. Victory was claimed by both sides. Vietnam had become America's longest, costliest conflict. This is the war Bobby wanted to fight. But then for him, disaster struck. When I got sick and had a high fever and uh, chills and all that, and they said I had malaria, and they opened my health records, and it said allergic to quinine sulfate, so they medically evacuated me from Vietnam. I come back from Vietnam two and a half months before I was 19, and I got robbed of what I wanted at the time in my 18-year-old brain. What I was doing good at, it really tore me apart because I had been achieving and doing so good. And I'm 19 years old, and, uh, and I know something is real awful wrong. In the jungle, malaria was a killer, and Bobby couldn't take the medicine, so his promising career was over. But he was still alive unlike so many of his friends. I was in Vietnam just under six months, and when I left, I only knew about four of them that were still alive. And one of them had taken several rounds from one of our own planes. Because it's because of mistakes. And uh, I don't know where any of them are now. I wish I knew where they were. I'd like to know what's happened to them. Any of them, I can see some of them just as clear as, clear as day. I can feel it. In 36 hours, Bobby went from the combat zone to his own front porch. He went looking for his old buddies and found them fighting against the war. And I'm out in the street and I been hitchhiking down to find some of the guys I'd been in high school with. I tried to relate myself to them, and it was difficult. I was neurotic, anxiety reaction. All I had was me. All I had was me, and I was good. Back home, Bobby got into drugs and into fights. Without his military career, he lost direction and chose to disappear. He couldn't handle his burning frustration and the disappointment he felt he'd caused his father. I grew up in the military. My father was in the military, retired 21 years, and there was a real pride factor that uh, felt like caused some kind of schism in the family. He never told me he was ashamed of me. I, it wasn't something I could ask him, are you ashamed of me? And I just don't know how to relate all of this to him. And I don't have very much contact with my family, and I want contact with my family. I care for them. These five acres of woodland are Bobby's world today. He bought them with money from his military disability pension. It's the only place he feels safe. Usually in the late afternoon, I get a fire going, 
Then I get some clean cardboard out here and take off my shoes and barefooted by the fire, light my lamp, read book sitting out here. You take a couple blankets and lay them out on the cardboard on the pallets and get comfortable. Sometimes when I'm like that, I get this feeling that I've got it made. Why should I be upset about anything? I've got a place. And sometimes it just strikes me as real funny. I start laughing, thinking about it, because I'll be sitting here alone going through all of that. And when it comes back down to it, I don't want to spend my life alone. And when it comes down to it, to walk off the clean cardboard barefooted in the night, and it's sprinkling, and you get mud between your toes. I think I got a long way to go before I'm gonna really fit, start filling any kind of hole. I don't think I'm worthless, but there's times, times when I wonder, times when I've wondered if it was worth going on. But inside, deep inside, there's this little place, the only place it could be safe. The turmoil is intense sometimes. I wonder if you can ever get it out of your system. I mean, it just boils up. And it feels like it's rotten. And you want to want to break something, want to hit something. Maybe we did. Try to keep a grip on it. You don't really want to break anything. You really don't want to break the window. You don't want to break the chair. You don't want to kick the dog just because you're angry. Bobby's gone underground in his own country, and he's not alone. Just on the other side of the mountain, north toward the Canadian border, we discovered another man who Bobby's never met. Once a career soldier, his name is Fred. Nobody lives around here, and I'm isolated. I like it here. There's a creek by, I catch fish, lots of wood around here. The biggest thing is isolation. I don't get hassled. I have a hard time dealing with authority. I don't have to walk down a street and, and wonder how come I don't have money in my pocket and why everybody else is doing things, you know, and they're going places and uh, spending thing, you know. If I get out here, I can walk, I can even talk to myself and, and feel comfortable. So I like to maybe just live in my own dreams. Where I'm camping out right now, there's a creek on this side with wooded area, which there's nothing over there but brush and woods. And behind me, there's a drop off to the creek, which is the same inside. All stickers and brambles back there, nobody comes through and there's only one trail here. So I can, I can sit here and if I hear noises, they don't, there's only one way they're coming through here unless they're hardcore out to get me or something. When it's really uh, right in between light and dark, it's dusk out, you know, and it, when things start losing their shape and their form, and all these trees around here will get real bright white, almost uh, day glow color. That creek will take on almost a music. You, you, I swear to God, like, you, you listen to it in the evening, and you'll think the radio's playing. You can hear some kind of symphony music down there, and over here, you're hearing rock and roll from the feeder streams coming in. And the later night it gets, it starts almost talking to you. I uh, used to hear all these songs and people talking, you know, and I, I, I understand where they're coming from when they say Babylon Brook, because uh, it, it, it will talk to you at nights. Nothing in Fred's upbringing could have prepared him for this kind of isolation. Fred grew up in a small town on the West Coast. It was a strict blue-collar suburban life. Fred's father was a truck driver, and although his parents were divorced, Fred was like any other kid on the block. He hung out at the playground and played trumpet in the high school band. But Fred had always wanted to be a soldier. He joined the Army as soon as he could, before he'd even finished high school. On my 18th birthday, I came home, and I says, guess what? I got orders from Nam. I'm going to Nam. And that's exactly what it was. And because I got orders, I went. 
that was very basic. I mean, I asked my dad, uh, I asked him about Vietnam. I asked him what it was. A lot of people was, protest was going on then. And uh, I didn't get too much response. All I was told was that you're an American, do your duty. Fred's job had been training new recruits to fight for their country. He loved the Army and believed he was preparing his men well for Vietnam. But what Fred saw in combat quickly changed his mind about the war. The bullshit, just a pure, undulterated bullshit, shooting the civilians. Uh, we had an, what they call an open housing project with the 101st Airborne. And in order to get rid of the VC, we would go in and drop leaflets over the village and tell them they had a few minutes to get out, grab what you own and run, and we'd come in with helicopters and uh, completely wipe the fucker out. And right after that, uh, cranes would come in with bulldozers and level the villages out to their just a bare spot of earth. So what it, what it created was all these people would be living in foxholes, only a little bit more intricate. That was started to turn me sour. I had one pilot that didn't like to have a door put on his ship. He liked to fly low over the rice paddies and pop rounds off at the workers. You know, just sporadically shoot them. Uh, some would chase him down with rotor blades. In particular, what made me quit flying was uh, the shooting up of a mother and some kids and uh, some other shit. And, my, you know, everybody is go gung-ho over there about body count that they didn't give a shit if it was six months old or 60 years old. They wanted to hear we've killed 5,000 gooks this week and we only lost 1,000 Americans. Well, our 1,000 Americans were all trained fighting men and our 6,000 we killed over there, probably most of them were very innocent civilians. I can't expect an 80-year-old papa son to be packing a, any real heavy arsenal on his back, you know, to be doing me any harm. Now, he may carry word of mouth, but shit, everybody does that. It wasn't until I was halfway through the Vietnam that uh, I didn't care anymore. Like I said, I'm just gonna go day by day until I die. I didn't really figure on coming home from the Nam. It was pretty difficult. After Vietnam, it was all different. New ball game, survival only. Everybody else don't matter, just me, it's survival. I can't say I, I wake up in cold sweats and I hear voices and uh, bullets going off and mortars coming in. It's so regular. It's like living all alone in a nightmare that somebody else created. You can't describe it to nobody. I guess it's like trying to describe a color to somebody that has never seen color, you know. And it's all yours. Even out here, I'll get a paranoia coming in that's so strong. I've been known to make dummy camps somewhere else and even keep a fire going. The paranoia's so strong, and then I'll crawl off in the bushes. And I don't keep guns because uh, I have a bad habit of shooting at things when I have a gun. And uh, I even have a second wife that would attest to that. So I don't keep any guns. The biggest thing I keep is hatchets and knives. And I ain't afraid to use them. And when the sun's shining and I'm walking through the woods, I'm glad to be alive. When I catch a fish, I'm glad to be alive. The majority of the time, I feel bad about surviving. I feel real bad. Out here, it's just a slow, lingering death. It goes on day by day in my mind and in my body. There are men who have been hurt beyond pain and into the depths of despair. They are, for the most part, combat veterans who saw a great deal of action. They don't trust, and they live alone in the mountains, canyons, and deserts around the nation. They believe in nothing this nation has to offer. They kill themselves often, and they run and hide like animals. If you corner them, they'll fight like men possessed. You may say they're beyond hope, so what can anyone do? They're tired now. They would never ask for help from any man. All they dream of is to turn back the clock. They have lost all that ever was for them, except Nam. This is Carl. He wrote those words trying to come to terms with what he's become. He lives in this school bus with his wife, Sharman, and three kids. Things could have been different for Carl. He grew up in suburban Indiana, where his father worked for General Motors, a comfortable middle-class life. That was before Carl went to Nam. We all believed in it. We were from a real, or a suburbia setting, and you know, it was an all, uh, gung-ho school and there were a few people that wanted to go to college to stay out of the draft because they didn't want to get blown away and there were most of us who just thought this was the right thing to do 
I was just coming into my own, I think. And I felt a real breath of fresh air, a real outcoming and a real life ahead of me. And then I was drafted. I handled the radio and I called in airstrikes and if those airstrikes weren't what pulled those bodies apart, then I don't know what was. And if my machine gun rounds didn't stop the machine gun fire that was coming at me, then I don't know who else did. And there were three incidents where I'm absolutely positive that uh, I watched a man go down in my sight. There was a lot of lead in the air the whole time I was in Vietnam. There were people screaming and there were loose rounds. I covered my friend's asses. They covered mine as a good soldier. Truly the saddest thing was leaving my friends behind, getting on the chopper, with every cell in my body screaming to get out of there, that it was over with, and looking down and watch the ground of Vietnam fly by underneath me for the last time, knowing that I just left myself back there. But when I got out, I quickly realized that I no longer fit in the place that I fit before I had gone to Vietnam. I chose to leave, get out of my family's life, and go to the wilderness. And I feel that my isolation was more of a move to insulate those people from my anger. I find myself fighting just to be left alone. I think anger kept me from being so humble that I didn't just check it in, blow my brains out. I've considered it daily. Well, my family keeps me together to watch my children grow and watch them playing is painful and it's joyful. It's the only thing that gives me the therapy that I need to sit and watch the garden grow, so to speak. That's easy for me to do, to watch them play and watch them laugh. I'm afraid that 90% of the time it's painful because of the potential that they're being bred for nothing but cannon fodder, like I was. Okay, yeah. I realize that if anybody ever tries to feed my children war and try to draft them, I'd kill them. Carl doesn't keep weapons around because he doesn't trust himself with them, and he doesn't trust strangers either. Suspicion and violence are always close to the surface. Even Charmin avoided leaving the kids alone with Carl, knowing he was on the edge. Slowly, she's learned to trust him. But Carl still feels the only people who shoot straight with him are other Vietnam. It uh, has its own type of a society in it. It's kind of a balanced out, harmonious thing where things don't get wasted. Things that need to be done are done in their own time. One thing kind of supports the next. I can fit into that as a uh, just another link in the chain, as long as I stay in the woods. We all 
were in a war when we were young, thinking that we were patriots off to uh, protect the interests of our country. And once we got there, we learned how to stay alive as best we could so we could come home. Whether or not we were serving the best interests of our country, I don't know. But we all did it, and we all are now living the consequences of that. Sometimes I flash back to Vietnam. There's a lot of real clear memories there, a lot of real freaky memories, a lot of scary ones. Some are happy memories, too. Marty liked the Vietnamese. When he was interviewed by an American television crew 15 years ago, he wanted the Vietnamese to like Americans, too. We're in uh, Phuc Vinh at this time on a palace guard is the deal that we're here on. It's defending the city and the base camp. It's a pretty good deal right now. We've been able to make a lot more contact with the civilians around here and uh, kind of help improve our position as far as they're concerned. From where we were before in Tain uh, there's no contact with civilians there whatsoever. Anyone we found around there was usually enemy. And we couldn't mess with those unless it was uh, in an undesirable way. Uh, here we've, we've had quite, a, quite numerous contacts with the civilians around this area. And I think it helps, uh, I think it helps the effort an awful lot as far as uh, getting to know the people and getting the people to understand the American GIs as they really are. We've, uh, it was kind of weird talking to people that were from the states that were there just checking things out, but it was kind of nice seeing somebody from back home again. I thought about home all the time when I was in Vietnam. Sometimes thinking how nice it would be to be in the snow again and when it was so hot. The four seasons, you know, are real nice to be able to appreciate. Like the springtime, you know, now it's everything coming back to life makes it real nice. I expected when I grew up I would probably be a farmer and live on a nice little dairy farm somewhere and have a raft of kids and uh, that would be the existence that I would end up with. That's what I did when I was a little kid. That's what I enjoyed then. Things have changed a lot since then, an awful lot. Marty got his raft of kids, but he couldn't hold on to them. After five years of marriage, Marty's wife, Diane, left him, even though she was eight months pregnant. Two little boys and a lovely woman. Things just didn't work out anymore. And it was decided that she wanted different things than living in an isolated place, you know. She wanted to get around more people, and she wanted to do it without me. And uh, this isn't a living space for one person. Now the boys and their mom are gone, you know. We live a mile or so from our road. We lived a half mile from our garden. And with children, just the physical demands it was putting on me was making it more of a chore than it was enjoyable. I mean, to not have um, hot and cold running water or to be cooking and heating with wood. It was really all things that happened more of a need with children. The conveniences I wanted them again. Talking about Vietnam was something that really had to be brought out. And when we first met, I think we talked about it more than we ever did later on. We had been around killing and um, being shot at and having friends that had been killed. and and. When he first, maybe when he, when we ever did first talk about it, it shocked me. And I couldn't believe that this gentle person I had met had actually shot at anybody, you know, and killed anybody. Marty never seemed like a really happy person to me. It was very, that was one of the hardest things, was just 
just laughing and being happy was a lot of times it just wasn't there. And I really missed it. I really missed being happy. A lot of the men that did come back from Vietnam would probably be much better off if they hadn't. A lot of uh, after effects are not enjoyable at all. The heartbreaks, the confusion, people blowing themselves away. Marty came home from Vietnam a sergeant with a chest full of medals. He saves them in a shoebox. But today he lives alone with his medals and his memories. Maybe it is your time to be alone and find out what's really going on inside. But don't forget you're not alone. Someday I'll see you on a spotted horse ready again for battle. And I'll ride beside you as will many others of us and then we'll know why and who we are. Take it slow, my friend. That's about that. Carl and Charmin keep moving together in a way that Marty and Diane couldn't because Charmin is ready to compromise her needs for the sake of her marriage. The being in Carl that was formed when he was in a war situation is not the type of being that most people want to live around. That was an attraction for me because I'm not a typical suburban housewife. That's not what I was looking for. But holding on to Carl has not always been easy. Charmin spends weeks alone with her kids while Carl disappears into the calm of the ocean on a boat he bought with his government pension. I knew he was a Vietnam veteran, but that didn't mean anything to me at the time because I was sort of as younger than the war. I was looking to have a family and just happened to start with Carl. I don't stay around my family a whole lot. I leave, I leave a lot, and that's the agreement that we have. If it wasn't for that agreement, we wouldn't be together. I have to go off by myself. 80% uh, of the time, and I'm not much use as a dishwasher or a floor sweeper or d diaper changer. I feel caged if I sit still too long because I want to keep moving, otherwise I feel like I've given somebody a chance maybe to draw a bead on me, to use me as a target. When Carl's coping, I'm happy. I can cope. When he's not, Oh, I'm like on edge, waiting for him to find his release or figure out something he can do to resolve what's in his mind. When he finally leaves, I do feel relief because it usually has been building up for a couple of days, his need to go. Finally, oh, I can get back to what I want to be doing. And, and then I... It's not that much different when he's gone. If the wind's blowing a half gale, it's scary. If I'm ghosting through the doldrums watching whales, it's peaceful. It's a place to be by myself where nobody knows I am. When that's taken away from me, that'll be the end of what's left of me. So Charmin puts up with the hardships that Carl's absence creates. And like him, she's now marked by the legacy of Vietnam. The only reason that we're together right now is because I have made that commitment. If I leave Carl, then who, who is there? You know, I'm the only one left. And I don't, and the only reason he is with me is because I don't ask him to do anything, you know. I don't ask him to handle anything. I'll do more than my part so that he won't have to do that. Charmin protects Carl from coping with the world, but other vets in hiding are moving back towards a normal life. 
In Spokane, Washington, a man who'd lived for years in the Cascade Mountains took us out to an old trapper's cabin where he'd hidden after Vietnam. I didn't think anything about what you know, life was going to be like when I got back. I knew how it was when I got back, finally, you know. We were changed. This is Dean. He was the hellraiser of his family, in trouble with the law by the time he was in high school. He was given a choice, serve your country or serve your time. That was 1965. Well, like I say, through trying to reconstruct my life as it was before I went to Nam, uh, it just didn't work out. I, I just couldn't get along with, you know, my friends that were still bebopping back here on the block. I headed for the woods. I just headed for the woods, just like I say, to get my shit together. Not to feel sorry for myself. Hell, I didn't have to. Again, like I say, I didn't have to go into the woods to feel sorry for myself. I could have done that at home. Hell, I could have put a bottle of beer in one hand, you know, cigarette in the other, and watch TV and feel sorry for myself and be twice as comfortable. When he joined the service, Dean was cocky and street smart. Two years in Vietnam broke his spirit. Dean's wife welcomed a stranger home from the war. I told her, listen, I just want to get the hell away for a little bit. Just do some, you know, get some time under my belt and do some thinking. God, she was all for it. She was just glad to see me go because I wasn't doing any good at home. I headed for the hills to a place that I knew about and just uh, got to stay in there. You know, I didn't intend <laughs> to go into the mountains and spend a lifetime of being up there. I just intended of going up there and trying to get my thoughts together and trying to regroup try to find out a little about myself. And then, like I say, it just snowballed from there. Dean wanted to get away from the world, but it didn't work out that way. Other vets heard about this mountain man up in the hills. One decided to join him, and soon there were seven more. They found Dean surviving on skills he'd learned in the jungles of Vietnam. Yeah, when I first got up here, I didn't come up here to live like Grizzly Adams, but then there was times that naturally you had to feed yourself, so that's what we did. We lived, we more or less lived off the land. Everything we, we ate, a lot of the clothes we made were out of hides like this. You know, I have a complete set of buckskins and everything, but like I say, I'm not living in the 18th century, you know, I'm living in the 20th century. I spent about nine and a half years in the mountains. I always come out here, recharge my batteries. But I live in town now. Well, let's face it, I have got to get into the mainstream of life. There's things that I have to do. So Dean moved home to his wife and took Vietnam back with him. I could be sitting in the house, and all of a sudden, uh, a car will be going down the street like a newer car that has a little wine, and you right away you associate that with incoming mortars or whatever. You see lights flashing off the wall or something like that because of car lights. And it's just association, flashing and everything like that. You get to thinking about that. We got into a firefight in Berea. It was raining so hard. You couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. I was so scared I was shitting my pants. This is the first time I'd ever, ever been in any kind of a combat situation. You could go ahead and shoot out into the open, but you didn't know what you're shooting at. They had us trapped. And the APCs were just running around. Hardly anybody was shot. When everything, uh, when, when it was all over. When it was all over, there were more bodies and parts and pieces of bodies in the tracks. They were just literally running over everybody. When we had to clean up, we was pulling Bart's bodies out of the tracks. Hell of a war. Hell of a fucking war. We memorialized the soldiers who died in the war but we often ignore the men who survived. In Vietnam, they fought a war for their country, and back home, they fought a second war with their country's conscience. 15 years later, 
There are still soldiers in hiding, still fighting to forget. Hell, this is it. I can come up here anytime. And I and I remember. This is my memorial. Being home, seeing a beautiful country. Christ, that's memorial right there. Being healthy, being alive, raising your kids. That's memorial. I'm getting to the point where I don't want to be a Vietnam veteran. I just want to be a person, that's all. But there's one thing I can't do. I can't stop being a Vietnam veteran. Like I say, I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran. of the people that died, at least they died with the feeling that, that they were defending their own kind, you know. They died with some kind of an honor. But, uh, sitting in a bar for the rest of your life so you don't have to think about your own trip. It happens to a lot of people. And I think maybe a headstone with a flag next to it would be just as calm as that. A lot calmer than that. But <laughs> Who knows? I'm glad I survived Vietnam. I don't know if it's even stopped yet. I don't know if it's even over. I don't think. In my head, it's not over.